Well, good morning. How is everyone this morning? Would you just stand with me for a moment? This morning is going to do something a little bit different. And so if you're online with us, I uh, hope you'll just uh, go along with us. This morning, we just wanted to take this whole worship service just to remember what Christ did for us upon the cross. So as we come in this morning, I want us to think back of what Jesus said for us to do when he went with his early disciples and just remember. And so we're going to celebrate communion this morning. Communion is a sacred time for us as followers of Jesus. It's a time to remember. It's a time to reflect. It's a time to respond to what Jesus did for us on the cross. And he made a point with his early disciples to create an intentional time together to share what was going to happen to him before he would go to the cross to die. Now, my imagination in this moment is that they were probably in disbelief and even in denial of what was to come when he shared it with them. I mean, after all, he was their friend. He was their leader. They definitely would not want him to have left. But through a common meal of bread and wine, Jesus made the simplest of items represent what was to be the most bittersweet moment in history. And he wanted them, he wanted us to remember. So before we rush in this morning, we wanna pause and just create some space for you to have some reflective moments in worship and even in self-examination. And while we know this is an individual time between you and God, we hope that this morning can help guide you your thoughts as we worship together in preparation for this beautiful time of remembrance. Can we worship together this morning?
is God when face to face we see
powerful name. You may be seated this morning. I just want us to take a few moments as we prepare our hearts to take communion. I want us to just come before the Lord this morning with clean hearts and clean hands. And maybe God's been convicting you of something, maybe something in your life. You're just like, I need to give this up. I need to give this over to him. And so I was in Nashville a couple weeks ago. I was visiting my son, and I, I knew this day was coming, and I just woke up early, 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 because they're an hour different than we are. And so I'm just up, and I just began uh, reading through some things, and I come across this prayer that just really struck me and convicted my heart. And I was, I was thinking about this moment here. And um, I thought this morning, if you just kind of bow your heads, and I want to pray this prayer. And it's very much an individual prayer, but I, I want it to encapsulate this moment for you as well. And so let's just bow our heads and we're going to pray together. And I want you to just let these words just soak in your brain and in your mind and as they resonate with you. Maybe you and God will have some business that you have to do this morning. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I bow before you in humility and ask you to examine my heart today. Show me anything that is not pleasing to you. Reveal any secret pride, any unconfessed sin, any rebellion or unforgiveness that may be hindering my relationship with you. I know that I am your beloved child, having received you into my heart and my life and having accepted your death as penalty for my sinfulness. The price you paid covered me for all time and my desire is to live for you. Lord, I know in a few moments I will take the bread representing your life that was broken for me. And I remember and celebrate your faithfulness to me and to all who will receive you. I cannot begin to fathom the agonizing suffering of your crucifixion. Yet you took that pain for me. You died for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your extravagant love and your unmerited favor. Thank you that your death gave me life, abundant life now and eternal life forever. As you instructed your disciples, I too receive this bread in remembrance of you. And in the same way as I will take this cup representing your blood poured out from a splintered cross, I realize that you were the supreme sacrifice for all of my sin, past, present, and future. Because of your blood shed for me and your body broken for me, I can be free from the power and the penalty of sin. Thank you for your victory over death. You took the death that I deserve. You took my punishment. Your pain was indeed my gain, and today, I remember and celebrate the precious gift of life that you gave me through the blood that you spilled. But while my relationship is secure with you, I know sin can break our fellowship at times. I'm still human, and I often forget who I am and whose I am. And you want to convict me and correct me and not shame me. You love me like a perfect parent. You'll never disown me or leave me. You love me no matter what, but sin hurts both my heart and yours. So before I take communion today, Lord, I'm asking you to truly search my heart and reveal hidden things for which to ask your forgiveness. God, I pray these things in your name. Amen.
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Just sing that chorus. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he walked in white as snow. Lord, I need you. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. This morning you should have received a, a little cup with some juice and a wafer on the top. If you would, just peel back that top layer and take the wafer. It says in Scripture... And as they were eating... Jesus took the bread, he blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. I can take the bread. If you want to take the other part off of the cup, scripture, it says, then he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of your sins. You can take the cup. I'm going to put a prayer on the screen for us. If we would just stand together, I want to just read this together. Let's read this together as our prayer as a body of believers this morning. Each time I take communion, Lord, I want to recommit my life, my heart, my thoughts, my everything to you. Fill me today with your powerful spirit. As I leave this place today, help me to hold this fresh remembrance and the story that never grows old close to my heart. Help me to share its message faithfully as you give opportunity. Lord, I pray for those who don't know you as king of their lives. I pray that I would always have room in my life, in my heart, and even in my home for the lost and the broken. I pray for the people who are represented by these empty chairs on each side of the stage who don't know you. Use the people who wrote down the names of individuals who don't know you to bring them into relationship with you. I ask you today, Lord, with an expectant heart in your precious name, amen. Can we just respond to God's goodness and we'll sing the song together? What he's done, what he's done, all 
the glory and the honor to the Son. Amen. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. Aren't you thankful this morning? He has won Even death is dead and done His life has overcome Speak, say the name above all names Over every broken place He is risen from the grave Let's celebrate what He's done What He's done Aren't you grateful this morning? Maybe turn to two or three people and say, I am so thankful this morning. Well, good morning, Riverside Church. How are we doing this morning? Okay, cool. <laughs> Well, it is incredible to be alive today. Uh, my name is Court. If I haven't gotten the chance to meet you yet, I work with the young adults here at the church. And so if this is your first time, whether you're online or you're on the patio or you're in this room right now, we just want to say welcome home. It is a phrase that we love to say because we really believe as over time you come here or you're watching or you're experiencing it anywhere in the world, it does feel like home here. And so if this is your first time, we do have a, a gift for you and we'd love to get to know you. I have a few people back in the next steps area when you leave these doors. Um, Dorcas, Brooke, and Kara would love to meet you. So please go see them this morning. We also, uh, one of the things that I got to experience um, from afar, I haven't, I wasn't there live. I wanted to update you though, uh, just for on behalf of the student ministry and the kids ministry. Wow, the father-son night, what an experience. Uh, fathers or sons, were who were there? Anybody there? Okay, I see a few hands. Wow, from uh, online and then I was there Friday night because our young adults had an event, and I curled around the back, and there was tons of cars and a fire and games going on. I'm like, this is powerful. And so I just want to say, 
Thank you so much for participating, even from afar, of celebrating fathers and sons to be with one another and have a time and a moment with each other. So it's really cool that we're getting to do that. Um, the other thing that I'd love to encourage, there's two things we have, the uh, baptism and discover. Those are things that we want to continue to remind you guys about, whether discover to learn and be a partner of Riverside Church, if that's something new to you, or if you want to learn more about who we are and what you're a part of that mission. And as well as baptism, when we have those moments, if you have not been baptized before and you want to tell people that you have given your life to Jesus, this is a great place to do it, to be with our church body and our family. Um, I have been learning in this season of life, and for, if I'm really honest with you guys, for a long time. It's something that God's been building in my life, and I would say, um, as the story of Jonah, as I have moments of like, yeah, God, I'm going to do this, or, and then all of a sudden it's a rebellious moment, I'm like, no, I'm going to go this way. <laughs> I think that God's been teaching me in this season of life is how to be a steward of my time, my money, everything. And that's been hard. It's been something that I've had to wrestle through years on years. And in this season of life, God's been pressing that in my life. And I want to encourage you, whether that is with your time or with your finances, that you continue to press that into God. That is something that I have been encouraged by in this moment. So... We'd love for you to partner with Riverside if you're not doing that already, um, whether that's with your time or your finances. And you can do that uh, on these four ways, whether you want to, there's boxes out when you leave these doors or if you're online, you want to text it or do it online, or you could do it by mail. But I want to be clear of two things. If you're new, do not feel obligated to pay or give money. We just love that you're here. And two, if you're like, wow, why, why do we have to give to Riverside Church? I love that Steve provides an opportunity to say, give where your heart desires to support. Just make sure it's providing a support for God's kingdom. And so, thank you again for being here. Steve's got a, another message as we continue in the story of Acts and our message sent. So, check out the video. Um, we're going to open the word and have some time in scripture, just hearing from God and see what's in there. But I'd love to take a minute before we start. I can't seem to stop thinking about the Ukraine and what's going on in that part of Europe, which makes me think about other countries that have been in war for decades. At this time, I think we see such a glimpse and it, it just brings it home of what the families are going through as they try to figure out <laughs> what do we do now, um, so anyway, I'd like to just take a minute and pray. I'm going to pause for a moment. I'll, I'll say some words out loud at the end, but I'd love to take, give us all just a second to pray for the people who are involved, people who don't want to be involved uh, from whatever country, and that God would intervene and stop that aggression. Father, my heart is heavy as we uh, hear news and see faces of people uh, going through just an unimaginable difficulty. As um, I imagine for them, the, the thoughts are difficult to make stop racing, to figure out what their next steps are. God, I pray, I pray that you just provide safety for the people of the Ukraine, that you would... Um, Lord, give them shelter and protection. I pray for soldiers in their army and their military that are making decisions on whether to 
to stay and fight or to send their families across borders. I pray for soldiers in the Russian army, Lord, that you would cause them to question what they're doing. Uh, many of them being told information that may not be true and, and uh, that willingness to raise arms against people who have not harmed them. Uh, God, I just pray that you would, you would continue to create an upswell of, uh, of rebellion there to say, no, we're not going to do this thing and that you would bring peace, Father. And I pray that uh, you just give wisdom to those in power to make decisions that could uh, stop this, to step in in the right ways. And God, I just, we ask for peace. And Lord, we pray for wisdom from your word and for our brothers and sisters in all parts of the world, but especially those in Europe who are in, find themselves on their knees today asking you to intervene. Um, Lord, we just ask that you'd speak to us from your word, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Um, there was a woman who had an embarrassing disease, a disease that couldn't be cured, and it kept her away from church. She stayed near her house. She was isolated. She lived somewhat alone because of that, and one day she heard about a cure, someone who could do something, and she rallied her courage. She pressed through a crowd of people, and she saw him there the one who she had heard about, the one who had answers, the one who had the power, the one. And she was convinced if she could just even touch his clothes, she would be healed. And she did. She got through the crowd, she touched his clothing, and she was healed. But Jesus, who was the one she had heard about, he stopped and he turned to her and he called her out in front of everyone. Her story is in the book of Mark in the Bible in chapter 5. We spoke about it in August of 2019. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. But it must have been humiliating in that moment for that lady. Jesus stops everything. He turns to her. And maybe because of that, because of her shame or her years of loneliness, he calls her daughter. That's the only time he ever does that in scripture. He directly addresses this woman and he starts with daughter. And then he says something really, really important. Because if what she had done had gotten out, it may have caused a problem. People may have gotten confused, maybe even gotten led astray to possibly worship things or idols. Jesus needed to answer a really important question before she walked away. What exactly healed her? Was it touching him? Was it touching his clothing? Or was it him who healed her? Did, did what she did heal her? Was there magic in the garments? Was, is it what she touched? Or is it the one that she came to? Because when you read it in Mark, it was almost automatic. The moment she touched him, it was done. She was healed. But it was not because of what she did. It was because of who she chose. He healed her because she chose Jesus. It wasn't the touch or the clothes. It wasn't even her courage. It was Jesus. And he says to her and to everybody, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. It was her faith. It wasn't my faith. It wasn't the faith of the crowd. It was hers. Her faith, her decision that Jesus is the one who has the answer, that he's the one I need to get to, and her confidence in him, her faith. I think people get confused sometimes, and it's important to understand if God heals you, it's because he chose to, not because you did it right. If God saves you, it's because of Jesus, because you turned to Jesus, not because you said the right words or you stopped cussing or because you went to church. Does that make sense? This is important and it's going to show up in this passage in Acts. Church doesn't save you. Singing words, reading the Bible, cleaning yourself up doesn't save you. Jesus must do that because knowing Jesus is more than knowing about Jesus, right? 
If you got your Bible, open to chapter 19 of the book of Acts. We're going to be in verse 11. So Acts is in the back half of your Bible. You get Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts, the story of what happens after the resurrection of Jesus, after uh, the disciples are sent out, after the Holy Spirit comes. And Paul, the apostle, is in a city called Ephesus, which is here. Uh, here's Florida. There's the Ukraine. And Ephesus, Ephesus is here. Um, not that far from the Ukraine. I measured some of the distances this week. And if there are Russian tanks in Crimea, which there are, it, it, it's closer than uh, New Orleans to Ephesus. So it's just that part of the world that this is starting to happen. Uh, that's a city in modern Turkey now. It's not there anymore, but we know where it was. In verse 11, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. That's wild, right? But before we go further, who was doing the miracles? Was it, door number one, Paul doing the miracles? Or was it Paul's magic hanky with door number two? Or was it someone else entirely? Did you catch it? In, in 2007, I was in Nashville with uh, some students and we were working in a project to help provide houses and medical care for people with HIV AIDS back in 07. And um, the apartment that we were cleaning that day was um, belonged to a hoarder with AIDS. And there were needles and poverty and desperation. And there on his kitchen table in a pile, there was a stack of letters from a guy named Reverend Popoff. And he was asking for money from this poor man so that he could send a magic hanky to him, a prayer cloth he had personally anointed to heal this guy with AIDS, which meant that this guy had probably sent money in the past because he's on the mailing list and he's getting these direct appeals for this prayer cloth that this human says he had imbued with power. This thing that's happening in the Bible here in Acts, this is not that. Paul's hanky wasn't healing anybody. Paul wasn't healing anybody. It was really clear. God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. God was healing people and he was doing it through Paul. And there's places in the Bible, there's weird moments where people are healed when they touch fabric or bones. That is never because the object is magic. It's never because some human has imbued them with power. And it's never, ever for pay. It doesn't work that way. When it happens, it's always because God is using that to draw attention back to himself or to something else. In this case, he's drawing attention to the gospel. It is brand new in Ephesus. They've not heard of Jesus. And people are coming to hear what this guy whose clothes were being used, and we assume by people who believe they were taking it to the sick to heal people. They're coming to see where is this coming from? What's going on? And just like the charlatans who have appeared throughout history to claim some power or magic power in a cross, a fragment of a cross or bones or water that they control, the name of Jesus got people's attention. Specifically, some traveling Jewish guys who have been trying to help people with demons, which seems well-intentioned. Uh, there's a lot of demons in these places as we read through Acts, places where people are far from God where they don't know about Jesus. C.S. Lewis, back in 1942, he left us a caution. He wrote, there's two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors. The, the demons are real. This isn't the same as sickness or some misunderstood mental illness. You, you don't ignore them, and we also don't obsess about them. Then, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you 
by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. That's really bold. These traveling exorcists, they've heard of Jesus. They know of him. And so they just add his name to their bargaining process with the demons. Whatever it was doing, they just add him on like a charm, like a magic thing. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. Some were doing this. These seven in particular are an example. Seven sons of Sceva. What do you think is going to happen? Sometimes I wish it still happened when you see people do this on television. Um, what do you think will happen when you use Jesus without believing in Jesus? When you try to use him without actually knowing him. Do you ever do that? Did you do it at one point? You wear a cross necklace like it's a magic charm that it'll, it'll bring blessing or protection. Like It's like an amulet. You see people who hang crosses in a room to make the room feel safe. That's not how this works. Jesus is not magic. You can't chant his name and get stuff. You don't get your miracle by showing up and doing right stuff. Let's see what happened. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know. Paul I recognize, but who are you? This is one of my favorite passages. <laughs> I used to imagine that in the movie where the demon's voice comes out of that guy. And Jesus I know. Paul we know of. Who are you? Oh, the demon knows Jesus. It's not enough to know who Jesus is. It's not enough for demons. It's not enough for these seven guys. James talks about this in his letter. James, the brother of Jesus, another book in the New Testament. He tells the church that you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. It's not enough to just know who he is. Familiarity is not faith. It's not the same. Not even if you're trying to use his name to do good stuff. Jesus had really harsh words in the book of Matthew. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. And he continues, on that day, the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? That's this. That's what's happening in Acts. They're using his name to try to do good things, right? He, his last verse, that's 22, 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Oh, I never knew you, workers of lawlessness, chaos. Using his name, doing right things, but without him knowing them. Which means, I think, there are some whom Jesus does know. I want to be in that set. Some who know of Jesus, some are known by Jesus. I want to be in that list. I worked for uh, a church in North Dallas, and we had a key card system. Do you all have these? The, the fobs that you use for your office or your condo or the pool or the pickleball court? The little thing you swipe and get in, you scan the key fob over a um, sensor and then a door unlocks via a magnet. It's like magic. We had the flat kind that was shaped like a credit card. And so I carried it in my wallet in my back pocket. And we would walk to the door sensor to the student wing and the sensor was just a little high. So I would swipe my bottom, which <laughs> unlocked the door. And it wasn't because I used the right method. It was questionable. Uh, it was because I had the right card and they knew who I was. My name was on the list. My card was on file. It would trip the computer and trigger that sensor and let me in because my name was on the list. How do you get on Jesus' list? Known by him so he lets you in. He said... To those people, you must do the will of the Father. That's how he started. The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. How do you do that? Because some of the passages uh, right before this, Jesus, the same passage, he says, hey, a good tree, only a good tree can bear good fruit. You got to make the tree good for the fruit to be good. And then he says, 
somebody who hears his word and does them is like a man who built his house on a rock, not on sand, which I got to be honest, now that I live in Florida, I worry a lot more about that. I'm pretty sure our house is built on sand. Um, How do you do this? Well, let's look back at these seven sons, the the ones who were doing exactly what Jesus said would get them rejected from heaven. The evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. I mentioned this is one of my favorite passages, right? Seven men, I assume adult men, I don't know how big they were, they're big enough to be working independently, naked and wounded in a city where God was doing miracles through things that had just touched Paul. These guys use Jesus' name and they get the tar beat out of them. They're stripped, they're beaten, they are humiliated. Imagine being there. Then in Ephesus, Paul is in town preaching. You hear stories, you hear about this Jesus who the demon and this guy knows. He endorses that before they beat the ever living tar out of these false men who are using his name. What would you do? Would you be tempted to worship Paul's handkerchief? Would you laugh at that and then go home and sleep on it? Maybe some did, but many were afraid. This became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. It was lifted up. They heard about the naked and bleeding sons of Sceva, and they heard about what the demons said and did, and they were afraid. Who were they afraid of? The demon? Wasn't the demon. Were they afraid of Paul? Nope. They were afraid of Jesus. Fear fell upon them all. If using his name without actually knowing him got you beaten by a demon and the demon affirmed that Paul was on his list, that the demons recognized Paul, he's one of Jesus' people, then they decided we're going to need to listen to Paul. We're gonna need to pay attention to this Jesus because the demon that beat up those guys knew who Jesus was. They were afraid of him. They knew who Paul was because he worked for him. We're going to need to believe in Jesus and we're going to need to do what he says. The whole city, people were affected by this when it got out. Some uh, people approached Jesus one time. And it wasn't just random people. It was people from the crowd where he had fed thousands with the fish and loaves. And and there had been this miracle and they asked him. And so we believe they're asking him sincerely They said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Because this goes back. Jesus said, you got to do the will of my father, right? So a crowd comes to him. Hey, bottom line it for us, Jesus. What do we have to do? If you read this in the NIV, I love the way they say it. It says, what must we do to do the works God requires? It's the bottom line. If the only way to get on your list is to do the will of the father, then what is it? What is it? What must we do? I hope he answers, right? Sometimes people ask questions to Jesus and the answer is confusing. It's difficult sometimes when Jesus speaks and you think, I gotta go understand that he told a parable or a story. When this was happening, he hadn't paid for sin yet. And as he's preaching to people, he says things like, you gotta be perfect. (sighs) I think I can't do that unless he does it for us. So what do we have to do? We answer this crowd. He says, this is the work of God. This is what the Father requires, that you believe in him whom he has sent. There it is, belief. The original language uses this word pistuo, to have confidence, to put your faith in it, to trust him. When you believe something, you make a decision about it. I have chosen Jesus. 
This is the thing I will put my faith in. It's a decision that affects other decisions. You, you think about this. If you marry someone and say, I'm choosing this person, but you're still dating, well, I'm not sure you've made a decision. So you may not have right. No, you've chosen just this one. When it happened in Ephesus, many of those who were now believers came which is interesting, they're now believers. They had made a decision, either right then or they were fairly new Christians and they're starting to grow. They're realizing as that event happened that their, their new belief in Jesus didn't fit with some of their old lives, where they had come from, what they had come out of. And now that they're growing, they're hearing this, and going, some of these things don't fit because this new belief, this trust in Jesus is affecting stuff. Potentially, these people have been believers for just a little time now. Be careful when you judge people. Just because a person believes doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is finished. Right? It doesn't mean that all of that has worked its way through, that the Spirit's taken time to heal and unpack all the other stuff and go, hey, this is an area that doesn't really fit with who you are. Now, sometimes Christians are immature. And we've got blind spots and weak spots. These are some Christians who realize when they hear about what these demons did, they realize that there's some things that don't fit with my new faith in Jesus. Dilbert's friend, Wally, that Dilbert, um, he had a scan card. He had a security fob like I did, but he didn't understand it yet. And he didn't understand it until a complaint arose and Catbert instructed him, uh, people are complaining about how you use your security card it's Wally. Do you know these guys? Okay. If you're born younger, this is worth going back and, and looking up. Especially those of you that work in cubicles, you'll go, he gets me. We'd appreciate it if you didn't keep it in your front pocket and thrust it at the door sensor. So I, a friend sent me this because of what I used to do with my hip. And Wally walks away. I didn't know the security card was why the door opened. Um, <laughs> Suddenly, he's got a new belief. There's new information. Like, oh. And I assume now that he knows, it'll probably affect his behavior going forward to realize, oh, it's the card that opens the door. I thought it was. Anyway, the knowledge that the demons attacked people who were abusing the name of Jesus affected the new Christians, the new believers. And they came confessing and divulging their practices. They came in front of part of the community and said, hey, we need to tell the truth about some stuff. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came, it came to 50,000 pieces of silver, which was a lot of money. The best estimates, it's hard to take biblical money values and go, okay, what is that in dollars or in, in whatever? But what we know was the buying power of those 50,000 coins. A piece of silver could buy one sheep. So you think about a flock of 50,000 sheep, that's a lot. Or uh, an easier way, I think, is that was a piece of silver, a drachma, I think that's the word there, was a day's wage for an average worker. So I worked as a carpenter a few times in my life. I'm pretty sure I made about average wage. Wage. So I'm thinking through, I did the math. If I was working five days a week, which they were probably doing more than five, but five days a week and there's 52 weeks in a year. It's 260 days in a year. Some of you math professors, you can fix this for me for second service, but I think this is right. That would mean I would need to work 192 years to get 50,000 pieces of silver. I think that's right. It's a lot. And they didn't sell it. They didn't donate it. They didn't trade it. They destroyed it. These new Christians were learning that their talismans, their amulets, their little inscriptions, which was common in Ephesus, there's fine evidence of that. People would use these little magical chants, these little charms and things, uh, they were convicted now that they were trusting something other than Jesus. And Jesus is Lord, only Jesus. There was no room for using the spells and the magic and the lucky charms. And they decided there's no room to sell those 
and benefit from the profit of it. They're not going to let somebody else have what represented idolatry in their own lives. These things were the implements of idolatry, so they destroyed them. They didn't sell it and get the money and bring it. Oh, look, we got the money from it, but now these people are worshiping idols. But hey, we profited. They destroyed it. As a young believer, I... Um, got convicted about the music I was listening to. At the time, you had to purchase music on cassette tapes. And I wrestled with what they represented and what was worshipped in the lyrics to many of those songs. And I wanted to sell them and get rid of them, but then I thought, I probably shouldn't profit from this. So I wanted to give them to somebody, but I thought, I, some of these things led me down a bad path. I don't want to pass it to somebody else. Some of the songs are just celebrating sin. And so I burned them outside so I didn't get cancer. Um, <laughs> probably. I needed distance between the things that marked sin in my old life and who I was now. You don't always have to be that dramatic, but you think back, are there things that mark who you were, what you trusted before Jesus that you may need to make some distance from and say, this is no longer it no longer fits with what I believe now. You may need to do that. Are there things that you turn to instead of him? Things that are in the way of your trust for Jesus or markers from past sin that you keep around. Sometimes you may do that like a trophy. Nobody else knows what it means, but that little reminder, oh, I remember that night. I remember that one time. Maybe there's some illicit memory and you're hanging on to a little piece of it. Maybe you've got a secret friendship online somewhere with a friend that you shouldn't have. That's the friend that you um, almost cheated with. Or maybe you did and you think you really need to sever. It doesn't fit with your new identity. You may have to surrender your crack pipe or your tarot cards or your Ouija board or your, can I say stripper pole? You may need to get rid of it. Or your porn collection or your old passwords to those secret accounts online that you got there just in case you think, well, if I ever really struggle again, I know that I can get to the porn over here and it won't show over here. You may need to get rid of some of that stuff. Maybe there are other things in your way. Not good things that bring comfort like a warm blanket or a couch or a cold drink on a hot day, but things that are in the way that call for your trust that tell you, say, hey, it's okay to worship Jesus, but save some worship for us too. <laughs> That's a problem. Most of you probably don't have idols, but are you reading your horoscopes? You, you looking for comfort in some piece of the occult that predicts the future for you? You're wearing good luck charms or you celebrate evil in your music or movies? You, you gotta work through that. You gotta wrestle through where that line is in your own life. But keep these Ephesians in mind. Their knowledge of Jesus, his knowledge of them, because they're on his list now, it led them to look inside. And they confessed what they found. Ah, oh, we found stuff that's not good. We need to go tell, hey, th we think this is a problem now. And I assume in the midst of that, they got help because that would have been hard. These are things they had trusted. That was intimate. Their spells, their charms, their little amulets that maybe their grandmother had given them because it had protected. They sacrificed it. They gave it up. You may need a minute today. God, is there, and ask him, God, is there something in my life that's in my way? Is there something that I trust instead of you? The stairs are open. They're always open. You may need to confess to him and pray to repent. You may need to confess to your life group. Tell him, hey, I've got some stuff I'm going to need some help with. I've got some stuff he's bringing up that I'm, I'm, I'm going to need to talk to somebody because if I keep it a secret, then I'm going to keep it a secret. And I'll, I'll keep my little reminders over here, but I need some people to step into this with. That's part of how this works. It's like that woman that I mentioned at the beginning. She got up the courage to go to Jesus so he could heal her embarrassing problem. And he did, but he also made it public which is probably not what she expected. But now that everybody knows, hey, she's right with him. She set, he set her up so she could be in community now. Like, hey, people, th this woman's gonna need community. She doesn't do this alone. God's healed her. We have community. 
Everybody comes to Jesus damaged. We all come with embarrassing things we wish he would heal. And over time, he deals with sin. Some of it, he leaves there a while. Some of you have deep old scars. It may be years before he's like, okay, we're ready to address this now. Whole new sins as you grow will get a grip in your life. You'll need community to work through that. Our life groups are a key piece of that for us as a church. They're a safe place to work through. We do work to try to make the life group a safe place where you find out when you're not alone and there's people who walk with you. So get connected. Talk to next steps out here at the window or get on the 411 page and figure out how to get some community. In verse 20, the word of the Lord continued to increase. I'm sorry, so the word of the Lord. That's important. Their public repentance made it grow. Because they did that, and they're saying, hey, we're gonna do the work God requires. We believe in Jesus. That was the thing. But now, that's making us look at our lives and go, some of this stuff doesn't fit anymore. And they brought it forward. They burned, that they renounced their old ways. That public repentance made the word grow and prevail. The word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. It pushed back the darkness. That little church that's starting right there in Ephesus, that becomes the church that we read about in the book in our Bible called Ephesians. It's the book where Paul explains how you get on Jesus' list, how they got on it. He says it in the first chapter as he writes to him, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, they heard the truth, I mean, we're reading it in Acts, what he's talking about here in Ephesians. They believed in Jesus, they knew him, and then they were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. They're sealed in him. Once you believe in him, the Holy Spirit is given to you and you become his, known by him. And the Spirit, he continues, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit given you is the guarantee. You're on his list. You're in. You won't face him and be rejected one day. You're on the list. He knows you. You're one of his. Not because you did the right things or went through the motion or used right words, but because and only because you turned to him the right one. And you put your confidence in him. You believed in him, which is what he requires. Because knowing Jesus is not the same as knowing about Jesus. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? All right, I'm gonna pray for us. And I got a couple of words before we close out. Father, I'm grateful for the reminder Uh, There are places in the Bible where you boil it down. The work you require is to believe in Jesus, period. But there's also places where you show us the kinds of things that may happen once we do that. Once we have this new identity, once you're in, once we're sealed in you, you may work through some of the junk in our lives and who we used to be and things that we carry with us. And God, we're grateful for that. We trust you. We believe in you. We trust you to do what you need to do in our lives and to grow us into who you want us to be. And we're grateful for that. Father, we pray that you would continue doing that here. We pray that you continue doing that in our brothers and sisters in Ukraine who are, um, I assume, overcome with prayers for safety and deliverance and protection. And in the midst of that, Father, you would give them confidence in your love for them and your knowledge of them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Read a little bit more from the book of Ephesians. In there, Paul describes them and he describes the sin that separated them from God, the sin that used to separate them. Same sin that separated us. And then he says, and this is one of the big buts in the Bible, okay? He says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Amen.
God bless you, church.